in the Jewish world over the last few decades, uh, I think we've had very few people who have led in uh, as consequential a way as Ambassador Dory Gold has. He's really one of the rare and indispensable leaders uh, of the Jewish people and of the state of Israel. Uh, and I think what makes him so interesting is he operates on three different uh, levels. Uh, first, he's really both an intellectual leader and a political leader. Intellectually trained at Columbia, PhD in international law, Middle Eastern affairs, uh, has been the president for many years uh, of the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, which is one of the most important think tanks in Israel, um, and has written books, articles, essays, on a huge range of subjects, all of them trying to illuminate uh, both the history and the current challenges uh, of the modern Middle East and of the Jewish people in a deeper way. Um, I think the second thing that makes him so unique is he is both a clear voice and often a very tough-minded voice in the defense of the Jewish state, uh, but also a very gifted diplomat. Um, and it's rare enough to find anyone who's good at either of those things, speaking boldly with clarity uh, in the face of those who uh, often are Israel's uh, challengers or even enemies, but also someone who can simultaneously build strategic relationships that can serve the Jewish people and navigate complicated uh, political waters. Uh, and finally, I think what makes him so rare is he can operate on both a strategic level and a day-to-day -day tactical level. He's thought deeply about the big story of Jewish civilization and the big strategic threats uh, and strategic opportunities that Israel faces as a regional power in the modern Middle East. He's also an important voice day to day on op-ed pages, on television, um, and informing us and informing political leaders who are really in the arena making decisions about how to think and what to do. So, Ambassador, it's really an honor to have you here. Thank you, Eric. Um, so, I thought we'd start with the past. Um, our theme tonight is Jerusalem. Um, I think we'll probably talk a little bit about Israel and politics in general, but I want to start with Jerusalem, but, but not today, but, but the past. Over the last couple decades have been some really fascinating archaeological discoveries, meaning, you know, new finds that give us new insights about the history of this city and the Jewish history of this city. I'm curious what significance you give to this, meaning in helping us think about the meaning of Jerusalem uh, as the capital, the eternal capital of the Jewish state and the Jewish people, and, and as it relates to the current debates? Good question. Uh, Jerusalem, what makes the archaeological discoveries particularly important at this time has been an effort undertaken in academia, in UN bodies, and in um, the media to question the connection of the Jewish people to Jerusalem. I documented this in the book, The Fight for Jerusalem, and a lot of it expressed itself in terms of the uh, question of whether the temple ever existed. You know, we have a real handicap in archaeology when it comes to talking about the temple because we don't allow archaeologists to go up on the Temple Mount to dig. So you'll always find a mufti or someone associated with the uh, waqf in Jerusalem who will say, let them prove there was a temple because they know that we're not digging up there. But even with that self-limitation upon us, the discoveries, not only the last, let's say, uh, 20, 30 years, but the discoveries over the last 100 years indicate unquestionably the existence of the temple. I think one of my favorite indicators of that is a sign discovered uh, near the Temple Mount in ancient Greek which uh, warns n presumably non-Jewish Greek speakers uh, around the time of uh, uh, the end of the Second Temple period 
that there are rules of entry into the temple, into the temple area. And the rules of, en of entry you know, s require that certain people can uh, t go through and certain people cannot go through. Uh, but what, do you have rules of entry to a special holy area if the temple didn't exist? And, and there are many more uh, indications of that sort. But um, the challenge continues. Look, you have the recent decisions taken by UNESCO speaking about UN bodies today, UN Human Rights Council, but UNESCO, which uh, in 2016 promoted the idea that um, there was an Islamic connection to Jerusalem, but just by being silent in resolutions emphasizing that Islamic connection, they were Im implying there was no Jewish connection to Jerusalem. I remember meeting the um, the head of UNESCO in Istanbul at a, another, at a UN conference that I had to attend as Director General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And I said, I have a suggestion for you. She was campaigning at the time to become the next, director, the next Secretary General of the UN. I said, why don't you take all the UNESCO ambassadors? Don't bring them to Israel. If there's a doubt about the existence of the temple, go on a Roman holiday and come to the Arch of Titus, where you have the Romans themselves engraving Roman soldiers carrying the implements of the temple, the Kelim of Beit HaMikdash. So, um, I don't want to go through all the archaeological items. Sometimes the doubt about the Jewish connection to Jerusalem expresses that there was even any Jewish civilization in Jerusalem. I um, produced a um, multimedia presentation about a year ago, and I make this point by quoting a professor from uh, University of Michigan, which I've always thought was one of the better schools in the United States. And he says there was no Jewish connection to Jerusalem, at which point I pivot to the royal seals of the kings of Judah that have been found. So, you know, what do you do about this in this sea of ignorance asserting these anti -Jewish, this anti-Jewish historical narrative? So, um, I know I've somewhat moved on to different uh, subjects, but uh, clearly there are discoveries that have been found, and there are more discoveries that will be revealed. But we are dealing with various communities in academia in the UN system and elsewhere that simply refused to admit the Jewish people had a connection to Jerusalem. And we have to push back. So jumping ahead to the modern Jewish history of Jerusalem, obviously one of the seminal moments is the 1967 war. So as you think about it today and you think about it in light of what we've learned since then, how has the 67 war shaped our understanding of Jerusalem, the strategic reality of Jerusalem, the political reality of Jerusalem? What is the enduring legacy of that great moment? If I may. Of course. You're the ambassador. You always <laughs> may. If I may, I want to take you into the end of the 1948 war because that molds our answers to many of the questions that came up in 1967. And I'll just share with you a moment I had as ambassador to the UN. You know, um, if, you have to, if you ask many foreign ministries in the world, what is the status of Jerusalem? Who should be in control of Jerusalem? you sometimes get this very surprising answer, even from Western countries. Isn't Jerusalem supposed to be a corpus separatum? The Latin expression used in UN General Assembly Resolution 181 for a separate entity, separate from the proposed Arab state and proposed Jewish state in the partition plan. 
So it's amazing that this suggestion refuses to die. I was um, appearing on the program at the end of 2017 of Farid Zakaria on CNN. And the issue of Jerusalem was, suddenly came up and he had on um, the, the well-known, I was going to say famous, could be infamous, um, Hanan Ashrawi. And there I am sitting, I was in a studio in, in Los Angeles actually, and there she was in uh, the Middle East, and she just pulled out of her pocket this notion that the solution is there, the solution is the corpus separatum. Now, that is relevant because there is this kind of fascination in parts of the international community, in people who engage in discourse on the conflict, that the real solution is internationalization of part of Jerusalem, all of Jerusalem. Depends who you talk to. All connecting up with Resolution 181. So I remember... Um, Back in 1999, there was a campaign being waged by Palestinian leadership to revive 181. And I had to deal with, as ambassador, a, um, I had to respond to a letter to the Secretary General written by Nasser al Kidway, who was the PLO observer at the UN, in which he returns to 181 and the internationalization proposals. At the time, my foreign minister was Ariel Sharon. My prime minister was Bibi Netanyahu. And there was a certain pleasure in talking to Sharon because Sharon contained in his voice and in his suggestions a historical perspective of modern Israel. So did the prime minister but there was something about the way Sharon delivered answers. And I called him on the phone. I don't think I used the secure line. You didn't have to on this kind of stuff. And I asked, Arik, they're reviving 181. They want the corpus separatum. What are your instructions to me? I mean, I could have done this myself, but it was, it was kind of a historical event. So Sharon says to me, I almost want to imitate his voice. Sharon says to me, look at Ben-Gurion's final speeches in 1949 in the Knesset on this subject. And uh, I said, well, what does he say? I'll, be, I'll look it up, but what's, what's there? <laughs> and he says to me, the suggestions made in Resolution 181 with respect to Jerusalem are null and void. In Hebrew, batel v'muvutal. That was even his intonation. Null and void. And Ben-Gurion has the explanation. Explanation was that here we accepted 181. By the way, there are um, historical critics of Israel who have to say, you see, you accepted the internationalization of Jerusalem. Ben-Gurion accepted the internationalization of Jerusalem. Why can't you do it today? If you read 181, it spoke about a 10-year internationalization, at which, after which the residents of Jerusalem could vote in a referendum whether they wanted the corpus separatum to attach itself to the Jewish state, the Arab state, or continue to be this international entity. And by the way, one of the considerations back at those, in those days was with the massive Aliyah coming into Israel, could it, live in the, could it move to the corpus separatum? And the answer was yes. So you're sure that you had the votes in the future to secure Jerusalem for the state of Israel. But never mind, I just wanted to get that historical background there because you're going to read some op-ed at some point which someone's going to say that to you. Write that. But um, 
What did Ben Gurion say in December of 1949? It's interesting because of the historical context also today. What Ben Gurion uh, reinforced was that in the end of the, well, during the Israel's War of Independence, we lost Jerusalem. We not only lost Jerusalem, but in the uh, Arab assault, Arab state assault on Jerusalem that was mainly carried out by um, Transjordan, the Hashemite Kingdom, the Arab Legion, um, the whole place was, was ethnically cleansed of Jews. There are photographs by a Life magazine photographer at the time showing the Jews rushing out through Zion Gate, haunting picture to look at. And, roughly at our best count, 55 synagogues, many of them very old, in the Jewish quarter were either destroyed or desecrated. And in the words of Ben-Gurion, speaking in the Knesset, the world didn't lift a finger. The only ones who saved the rest of Jerusalem from falling was the new Israel Defense Forces, Sahal. So as far as we were concerned, we were not going to rely on international resolutions. We were not going to rely on international assurances. We would have to defend ourselves by ourselves, which became the doctrine of national security doctrine of the State of Israel since that time. But it applied most of all to Jerusalem. And so um, this was contained in my response to Nasser al Kidwe in the 1990s with the encouragement of, he felt like my PhD advisor, Ariel Sharon. And um, Ben Gurion also wrote, because the question, the, fun, the philosophical, historical philosophical question Ben Gurion dealt with in his speech was would the new state of Israel? separate itself off from Jerusalem as not being associated with the state. It would just be sort of another entity. And he wrote in his um, speech, a nation that wept by the waters of Babylon in memory of Jerusalem is not going to give up Jerusalem. I mean, these were great men. So how did 67 change the landscape? 67, if you take the destruction that occurred in 48 and 49, and you add to that Jews not being allowed to return to the old city to pray, not being allowed to visit their institutions, their uh, religious sites, and then being able to, and then coming back. Uh, I think that created such a kind of historical moment, first for the people of Israel. But I think the victory of 1967 in Jerusalem had historical significance for the Jewish people as a whole. If you sat now with another chair with Natan Sharansky, I'm sure he would tell you that the, his, the, the Jewish national consciousness that grew in the Soviet Union to even challenge the Soviet state had its origins in the liberation of Jerusalem in 1967. And as a young person living in New England, where I grew up, I saw Jews who were embarrassed to identify as Jews suddenly become proud as Jews. But that might be more related to the military victory than Jerusalem itself. But Jerusalem magnified it all. And um, I think it 
led to a renaissance of Jewish identity that we have to recapture today. Was the political and military leadership in 67, as far as we know, united in the strategy of reclaiming all of Jerusalem? I mean, how did this political and military story unfold? Well, once Jordanian artillery opened fire into the western part of Jerusalem, I think in Michael Oren's book on the Six Day War, he says he got a piece of data that 6,000 buildings had been damaged by the artillery attack. Um, the first thing you're going to do when you have a modern army facing that kind of problem is move into the area where the fire is coming from. And if people want to know much about the shape of Jerusalem's borders today, I think it em they emanated from where uh, enemy positions were located as they fired onto Jerusalem and putting those positions in our hands and preventing them from going into hostile hands in the future. So let's jump forward. Obviously, about a month ago, as everyone knows, there was this momentous event of the United States uh, finally uh, opening up its embassy uh, in Jerusalem. Why do you think it took so long? I mean, what, why did this only happen now as you analyze the politics? Well, let's find when this becomes uh, sort of a, an America, American agenda item. The year is 1995, and you had a bipartisan resolution in the U.S. Senate called the Jerusalem Embassy Act, which called for moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, 1995. I think it was co-sponsored by Tom Daschle on the Democratic side and by Bob Dole on the Republican side. They never, they, I'm sure the two of them didn't agree on many things, but in Jerusalem they agreed. And the Jerusalem Embassy Act also had a waiver in it which allowed a president not to implement it for reasons of national security. So I think all the presidents were clinging to that waiver rather than uh, take a decision. It is always easy to take the route of anticipating a mass emotional reaction on the Arab side and then do nothing. It's easy to do that. You know, if you're making an argument in the chambers of Congress later or in the administration later and say, do you know what will happen if we move the American embassy? You know, we'll lose all our embassies from Kabul to, Mar to uh, Rabat. And, you know, people associate certain reactions, emotional reactions in the Arab world. And that didn't happen. Of course, a lot of things have evolved since then. Um, so why it took so long? Because it's more comforting to just not have to do it than face the uncertainty, political uncertainty, of what happens if you do do it. But I, during that entire period, and I testified in the House of Representatives at the request of a committee that held hearings on this, I felt the more I dealt with this, I was going back to my discussion with Arik Sharon about Ben Gurion. And I felt we were completing what we started then because, you know, Ben-Gurion, I didn't left this out, going back to 1949, he stood up in the Knesset and he made all these very important statements about the connection of the Jewish people to Jerusalem and the new state of Israel to Jerusalem. But he was warned. He was warned by this country and others. Don't you dare don't you dare move your capital, which is temporarily in Tel Aviv, to Jerusalem. Don't do it. 
And Ben-Gurion was made of that kind of special material that when he saw Jewish historical rights over 2,000 years on the table, you know, George Marshall didn't mean that much. And so he stood up in the Knesset, and among the elements that were in his speech was an announcement. It was actually in a second speech made in December in the, in the Knesset. We're moving the capital of Israel to Jerusalem. And for some reason, I thought of Ben-Gurion's speech all the time when the U.S. finally decided to move its embassy to Jerusalem. And um, why it took so long, we have to get some, uh, some of your historians to go to the National Archives in Washington and figure that out. So you said that one of the reasons is the fear of an Arab reaction gives right. leaders a, a, a reason to do nothing. There's been a shift, and you've been involved in this, in the sort of political alignment of the Middle East and where the relationship between Israel and other key Arab states has really evolved in the last many years. What do you see happening? How important is this shift? Is this a real realignment? Is this a temporary realignment? What's going on? Well, the immediate reasons for these new relationships between Israel and Sunni Arab states are twofold. The one everyone is, of course, aware of is the growth of the Iranian threat, which is not just nuclear weapons, but it's Iranian activism on the ground. You know, it's common to say, America doesn't want, put, want to put boots on the ground in the Middle East anymore. Well, the ones who have boots on the ground are the armed forces of Iran. It started back in 83 when they deployed the Revolutionary Guards in the Bika Valley in Lebanon. But since then, it's spread all over the Middle East. Of course, in Iraq, a former enemy of Iran, which the Iranians have completely penetrated. And uh, the Iranians have Hezbollah equivalents serving in Iraq, taking orders from the Quds forces of the Revolutionary Guards. It spreads to all kinds of other acts of subversion in Bahrain, the small little island next to Saudi Arabia, which has a Shiite majority and a Sunni government. That's sort of like sitting on a volcano in the, in the Middle East today. Of course, in Yemen, now the Yemeni Shiites, so to speak, are called Fivers, meaning they revere the um, fifth descendant of Ali, the son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad as a successor. And of course, the classical Shiism in Iran revere the twelfth descendant, not the fifth descendant. Now, all this sounds really obscure, but on this, on, these, on this point of who should be the successor of Muhammad, Middle Eastern wars in the 7th and 8th century were fought. So, uh, nonetheless, the Iranians are skilled at taking heterodoxy in Islam and taking those individuals to study in their academies in Qom in Iran and basically convert them to Twelvers. But there too, because there's now this civil war that has erupted between the Fiver Shiites, because the, the, um, the um, fifth successor of Ali, his name was Zayed, they also call these, uh, this movement of Shiites in, in, in Yemen, Zaidis, which always reminds me of what we used to call my grandfather, Zaidi. <laughs> That's an inside joke. <laughs> the Zaidis. But in any event, um, there you have Iranian boots on the ground in Yemen, sitting very close to strategic waterways that are nearby. You have the uh, Iranians, of course, taking up very powerful positions in Syria. Uh, 
which is a huge concern of the State of Israel, one that Prime Minister Netanyahu raises with President Putin on a regular basis, and one which Israeli Armed Forces, Tzahal, are dealing with as we speak. Um, What was your question? The, the, new, yeah, the, the new alliances, or the, yes. the realignment so of the Gulf states. As the Iranian activism, military activism, spreads in the Middle East, and the Arab states are more and more concerned about it, they say to themselves, you see it in the op-ed articles in a newspaper like Al-Shark Al-Awsat, the Saudi newspaper printed in London, you'll see references or you'll see sentences like, well, now we've learned Israel is not the threat to the Arabs, it's Iran. So this kind of mutual threat that Israel and the um, Sunni Arab states have is cementing relationships. Now, at the same time, there are places that are a little further from Iran, like Egypt. And they have a different, they've had a different focus, <coughs> ISIS. And um, the Islamic State, which managed to set up a presence in Sinai, which is significant because the Egyptian army has had a hard time defeating it. And Israel has established relations under the table to try and be helpful. By the way, in that military campaign in Sinai, which has still not been won. The security of Europe is involved. Because ISIS in Syria and Iraq led to a huge outflow of, um, of Arabs across the Mediterranean into Europe. And that, of course, is a huge issue in the politics of Europe today. But if ISIS is successful in Sinai, even after the West has defeated ISIS in both Iraq and Syria, and you get tens of millions of Egyptians, starting with the Copts, running for Europe as a refuge, then the problem you saw as a result of the um, exodus from Syria and Iraq will be far greater as they cross the Mediterranean and go into Europe. So all this is occurring. And now the Egyptians perceive Israel as a, um, as a close ally in that fight. Of course, they're bothered by Iran too, but this is the immediate problem. A collapse of Egypt in the Sinai campaign could also lead to a collapse of Egypt in the Nile Valley. So how did these changes and the political and strategic alignments in the Middle East shape or reshape the Palestinian question? And where does Jerusalem fit into this strategically? Meaning as Israel thinks about its options for managing you know, its relations with the Palestinian community, what does this mean for the future of Jerusalem as a city and as a part of Israel? Well, that's really made of two questions, the question of the Palestinians and then the question of Jerusalem. I mean, today, if you, you know, push and ask Arabs from the Sunni Arab world, they will, of course, repeat the mantra of the importance of the Palestinian issue. That isn't going to change. Although I have to share with you, I was in a Sunni Arab state as Director General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And one of the things you do when you are Director General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is you have a dialogue with the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of your neighbors. So there I am, I'll just make these, I'm not going to say which country it is, I'm just going to make up some names. So there I am sitting in front of my counterpart, let's call him Muhammad, for, for lack of creativity. And um, everybody who goes into these dialogues has their staff prepare talking points or bullets on a piece of paper. I remember there were 13 bullets on my piece of paper. And so Muhammad on the other side said to me, 
Well, Dory, why don't you get started? Why don't you uh, read your talking points? So I started going through the document that had been prepared to me by my staff. And they're just sort of going through it. One, two, three, these are our interests. And I'm looking at the face of Muhammad. And he isn't angry, but there's something there that's bothering him or that he wants to say. So I stop and I go, is it really this boring? And he goes, no, but I do have an observation to make already. And I said, what is it? He says, your talking points are identical to my talking points. <laughs> it's as though you got an advanced copy and you just <laughs> picked it up and used it for the state of Israel. So that shows, I think, it probably best demonstrates the, how our positions have become so much closer. They've become almost identical. And the Palestinian issue was not at the top of the list of either of us. And so where does Jerusalem as a city fit into the Palestinian question and Israel's options for addressing it? I think the um, Palestinian politicians are aware of this shift, very aware of the shift. Therefore, they look to a way of how can we get people riled up again. So the main riler, the main person who has been doing this is a um, Islamic leader actually from Israel. His name is Sheikh Raid Salah. Raid Salah is the head of the uh, northern branch of the Israeli Islamic movement. And he has been having these huge rallies with big Arabic posters and Arabic signs. Al-Aqsa is in danger. And the mythology that he's been putting over is that the Jews are planning to go up on the Temple Mount and take over the Al-Aqsa Mosque and perhaps even rebuild the Temple. So when you tell young Muslims who are, whose emotions you can play with, they're very malleable, and you tell them the Jews will want to destroy our Al-Aqsa, you can get, it's a good war cry. It's a good mechanism for mobilizing, for political mobilization. And that's what's been going on. Now, the reality on the ground, if anybody has endangered the Al-Aqsa Mosque, it's the northern branch of the Islamic movement. Because they've gone up on the Temple Mount, dug out huge amounts of earth, so they can create underground mosques under the Al-Aqsa Mosque. They're the ones who are doing it. We've, there are Israelis who photograph this, and we have the photographic evidence. By the way, in doing so, they've taken out archaeological, for lack of a better word, dirt, rubble, archaeological rubble, and dumped that rubble in dump sites around Jerusalem. Rubble with remains from the first temple. Now, our archaeologists said, ah, Okay, and they have been recovering the rubble of the Islamic movement and finding great materials there. We don't dig on the Temple Mount, but the Islamic movement did. So one of the most significant changes in Israel in general, and Jerusalem in particular in recent decades, is the growth of the Haredi community. And I think the statistic now is that about 25% of Israeli school children are part in some form of the Haredi community numbers even larger in Jerusalem. So how do you see the significance of Haredi growth in shaping the political life, the cultural life, the Jewish life of the city? Well, I'm a person who tries to be hopeful. And um, I had an experience when I learned in yeshiva in Jerusalem. The yeshiva I learned in was the yeshiva of Rabbi Chaim Bravader. And our yeshiva was broke. 
It's hard to raise money for yeshivas, not just for think tanks. And so, maybe it was my second year there, um, we reached an agreement with a Musar yeshiva, um, the Navardic yeshiva, which is in Gula, huge building, freezing cold. There's always a draft going out from in. Anyway, it was a Yom Atzma'ut, Israeli Independence Day. And uh, there's a Zion, religious Zionist tradition that on Israeli Independence Day, you say Hallel. There may be a debate. Is it Hallel with a bracha, without a bracha? But there we were, our yeshiva was sharing the Beit Midrash with a Navardic crowd. And I remember the, um, chief, the son of the chief rabbi of that Navardic group. And on uh, Yom Atzma'ut, you know, there's a question, are we going to say in the, in the Beit Midrash, Hallel with the bracha, well, we did what we wanted to do anyway. And then I ran into the son of the, of, of the rabbi of the Navardic movement. We ran to each other in the hallway. And he looks at me. And, he's, and he all of a sudden says, Gut Yantif. <laughs> Which means he was acknowledging Israeli Independence Day as a national holiday, which he could respect. I also found that uh, his father and their, counter and their colleagues back in 1948 fought against the Arab invasion. I mean, if you look at this guy and you look at his father and you look at the people around him, they don't look like, um, you know, religious Zionists who work the fields. But they, um, we have a lot that binds us. That's why I say I'm trying to be optimistic. And I believe that um, it requires awesome responsibility on the part of the leadership of the Haredi movement and the leadership of other movements, how we can live together. So maybe because of that experience, maybe because of my own sense of hope, I, I'm not afraid of the Haredi. And, um, but it really requires not scaring off the general Israeli population, particularly in Jerusalem. Are there two cultures in Israel today? Jerusalem and Tel Aviv? And are these really different cultural epicenters or? Well, there are multiple uh, cultural centers. Israel is a mosaic. There's not just one paintbrush you can use to describe uh, Israeli culture. We always have had the distinction between religious and non-religious, okay. But in each of those worlds, we now have Jews who come with all of their traditions from Russia, from Ethiopia, from the United States, from European countries. And so we really do, we are a, a rich, um, multiple culture, but it is extremely important given that fact that we build a culture of tolerance and we build a culture of living together. It sounds like a platitude, but it is vital for our future. And sometimes you will get religious leaders who rise up beyond the uh, easy conflicts that one could uh, create uh, who will carry the day. But we have to get beyond the great cultural conflicts that we have, because they're very strong. And they also threaten to separate us from our brothers in the United States. So one more question, and then we'll open it up. There are periodically these cultural flashpoints. I'd say one of them recently is the whole debate about the Western Wall, prayer at the Western Wall.
that lead many people to think that there's this growing rift between the diaspora and Israel, between the cultural sensibilities and uh, worldview of Jews living in America versus Israelis. So are you concerned, hopeful? How do you see the, the diaspora-Israel relationship as it exists today? Well, years ago, I'll share with you a horrible experience I had. Horrible. I was Israel's ambassador to the United Nations. There used to be an organization, you know, I just can't remember, it may be jet lag, it may be age, um, that trained the next generation of Jewish leaders in America. I think it was uh, funded by the owners of the Limited. Yes. And they train like the sort of people in their 30s, trying to identify them to become the next leaders. And they were having a, they were having a, um, a kind of Shabbat together in Palisades, New Jersey. And I was asked to speak to them on Motzei Shabbat. What I'm going to describe is not the kind of thing you want to tell people about, but I think it's important. There were 400 people. And it was a reunion from Boca Raton to Boston. And because I had been, before becoming ambassador of the UN, involved in the Palestinian negotiations, you know, sitting with Abu Mazen and Saeb Barakat for hours on end, I wanted to share with people, what are our red lines? What are we doing? And I reinforced the fact that Israel could never <clears throat> afford to withdraw to the 67 lines that Israel wanted to keep Jerusalem under our sovereignty because only a free and independent Israel would protect Jerusalem for all faiths. So I said my statements. And then all of a sudden, among the 400 people that were there, there were three or four people that seized the dais that wanted to voice their views. And the views I kept hearing, and there were rabbis there from all over the East Coast of the United States. But what they repeated to me over and over again was, you don't view us as legitimate Jews. And therefore, why should we defend keeping Jerusalem united for you? And it wasn't said by one person. It was said by half a dozen people. And I looked around at the rabbis who were there. I don't know, they were looking at the ceiling. You know, they, they didn't feel that they had a kind of responsibility. The Israeli ambassador is standing there getting uh, grilled by his fellow Jews. And it only seemed to intensify as the evening wore on. So I looked for something, you know, when you're in that kind of, with your back is against the wall, you got to find something to say. And maybe this was a mistake, and maybe it wasn't a mistake. But um, I had recently renounced my American citizenship in order to become ambassador to the UN. You know, you can't dance at two weddings. So, um, uh, in my right of reply to the 400 people, I said to them, you know, I'm no longer a U.S. citizen, but I still have American Jewish blood in my veins. And I grew up in the conservative movement. And I went to Camp Ramah. And I can tell you this, my counselors at Camp Ramah would never have blackmailed an Israeli diplomat because they had spiritual problems with Israel. The place exploded. <laughs> Somebody came up to me from the organization and said, well, we normally don't have extremists uh, lecture to us. Extremists. The situation was extreme. 
So I was guided out to my car. <laughs> but it was a shocker. It showed to me how far we had drifted apart. But it was also a warning. We gotta figure out how to heal the rift. And I can just tell you in the center I run, the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, I've commissioned uh, a study using focus groups, polling, to try and get at the core of the American Jewish-Israeli rift. I don't know if we'll solve it. I don't know if we'll have a, uh, you know, a, a study with, a, with suggestions of 10 steps we can take. But at least we have to look at it in a systematic way. What I essentially did back in 2015 is I created a dialogue between my think tank in Jerusalem, the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, and a Saudi think tank in Jeddah that was headed by General Anwar Eshki from the intelligence branch of the Saudi Armed Forces. And he had many parallel experiences to my experiences. He was well connected with the Saudi establishment he would get a phone call from the crown prince or from the king, normally patting him on the back for saying things that they couldn't say. And uh, we used to meet secretly in Europe for about a year. My team, his team, amazing. And then I um, suggested that he meet me, our next meeting be in New Delhi, in India. And one of my team was an expert on Hezbollah. And he had heard of a city in India where Shiite, Indian Shiites had their spiritual center. It was called Lucknow. So we all went to Lucknow and had our dialogue there which was also a lot of stories and was fascinating. But then when we were in Lucknow, we began to consider, myself and General Eshke, about what we were going to do about the Iran agreement. Both of us viewed it as a disaster. So a suggestion was made, why don't we arrange to give testimony to a Senate committee? jointly. And my kishkas began speaking to me, 2015. I said to him, you know, it's interesting, I'd love to do that with you, but I think we would be poking the Obama administration in the eye. But I have another suggestion. You're a think tank. I'm a think tank. Let's go to a, a think tank next to the U.S. Senate. We don't have to actually have a Senate hearing. And I'll tell you this, if an Israeli publicly meets a Saudi and they both together trash the Iran agreement, we'll get plenty of media. Don't worry about it. So um, I spoke to a good friend of mine who was running the Council on Foreign Relations. And he agreed that we would come. And we appeared there together. General Eshke, at my request, spoke in Arabic. We got somebody to translate. Everyone had little earphones. And um, I think that was the major experience I had with the Saudis prior to my going back into government, which was about two days later. Uh, I'll just say one thing, if you're wondering, since you opened with Hatred's Kingdom, how could I be the author of Hatred's Kingdom and then be a, an enthusiastic supporter of Israeli-Saudi dialogue? I'll just give you one piece of data. In 2003, 2002, when I wrote Hatred's Kingdom, our estimate was that uh, about 70% of the Hamas budget came from Saudi Arabia. And that was at a time when buses were blowing up in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. Uh, 
that you could link to the Saudi financial effort to back Hamas. In 2015, when I was meeting with General Eshke in all kinds of locations, Hamas wasn't getting a nickel from Saudi Arabia. I, Saudis might have been involved with all kinds of other organizations that I don't know. But in terms of Hamas, nothing. And the ideological position of Saudi Arabia on the question of the Muslim Brotherhood was one of hostility. So I had no problem with meeting with a well-connected Saudi general and having a dialogue with him. And the ones who had replaced Saudi Arabia in supporting Hamas were the Iranians. We have a general awareness of their thinking, but you can't know what it'll be until it's actually unveiled. Because they can sit with you and say, well, what do you think of this and what do you think of that? And then they fly to meet with uh, Mohammed bin Salman, and they get other ideas. So um, I feel that this administration will try its best to take into account Israel's most important security concerns. But I think we'll have to wait until they unveil the, unveil the, pro the proposals. And then we'll have to articulate very well what our most vital interests are. That's a very important question. And let's say tomorrow the Iranian regime is overthrown and declares that it wants good relations with its fellow Islamic countries in the Arab world so that the Iranian threat vanishes. What do the Sunni Arabs do? Do they go back to their hostility to Israel and the kind of embrace of Iran? Very important question. I think what we must do is utilize the time we have to try and create more permanent structures that link us to the Sunni Arab states so that a quick reversal is more difficult, if not impossible. And that's doable, but it requires a lot of work. It also requires help of the United States. Permanent structures meaning what? This is military and intelligence sharing of various kinds? Much of that will be under the table, and you can't talk about it. But, you know, I'm thinking of how, what happened uh, right after World War II. Take France and Germany. Had been at war for, for a very long time. Franco-Prussian War, World <coughs> War I, World War II. And they now found themselves facing core level Soviet divisions sitting in Czechoslovakia and East Germany. And they had to decide what they were going to do about this massive Soviet conventional superiority that was facing them. So they found that they had a great deal in common, despite their historical animosity. And because America provided the leadership, these countries provided the core of what, would, was, what was to become the NATO alliance in 1949. And it was the NATO alliance that balanced off the Soviet conventional superiority for mo much of the Cold War. So now we have uh, Iran having worked to rebuild its armed forces. Uh, trying to use the new budgets it received as a result of the removal of sanctions, opposing a real threat to us and to the Arab states. 
And in many respects, what we need is a Middle Eastern NATO. But if you call it a Middle Eastern NATO, it will never happen. But we need some kind of mechanism of coordination so that we can pose a counter, a counter threat to the Iranians as they seek to reestablish their hegemony across the Middle East. Uh, how that's exactly going to look, how that's going to work, what's the public diplomacy behind something like that, I don't know, I can't say. But it makes a lot of sense, given Iran's ambitions. Saudis used to say they want to rebuild the Safavid Empire, which was the Persian Empire in the 16th century. Your question contains a kind of assumption that, of attitudinal changes that allow us to create that reality. For me, it's not just the attitudinal aspects. It's the actual arrangements on the ground that have to be put in place. I think the Palestinians must have self-governing institutions. But there must also be limits on their military capacity, particularly if the Palestinian state that emerges is based in the West Bank. The West Bank is adjacent to the most vital parts of Israel where 70% of our population is located and about 80% of our industrial capacity. Sitting on the hills, the topography of the West Bank, any Palestinian state would dominate the lower territory. This is a fundamental Israeli military analysis. That's why when we talk about a Palestinian state, we always say demilitarized Palestinian state. So we have to find a way of creating the self-government institutions Palestinian people deserve. At the same time, protecting the state of Israel in the long term. What that means is that if that state emerges, it will not be on the 1967 lines. It will not be on what's called the 1949 armistice lines. It'll be elsewhere. And at the same time, we have to find a way of giving the Palestinians a sense of self-governance, statehood, whatever you want to call it, in which they feel that their, their honor has been respected. So it's easy to create platitudes. To translate that into a geographic concept is not simple. Well, you could say that about any nation in the Middle East, where you have multiple national movements. And look, it's clear that Hamas not only calls for the destruction of Israel, but calls, uh, calls for the destruction of the Jewish people. And you do not want to empower Hamas to take over a Palestinian state of any kind. I mean, if it's Hamas or nothing, it'll be nothing. Now, Fatah and the PLO, perhaps at the time of the Oslo agreements, there was hope that they were going to replicate the um, moderation that occurred with the African National Congress, the ANC, uh, in South Africa under Nelson Mandela. But Arafat was no Nelson Mandela. And they maintained their commitment to terrorism. So part of any real peacemaking is how to transform those societies on the Palestinian side to societies that really want to embrace peaceful coexistence. And that yet has to be proven. I've dealt with this issue for many, many years. I'm trying to think of something I wrote. I one time actually wrote an essay that um, proposed having a greater Jordanian role in peace structures that would emerge with the West Bank. 
I think I called the essay, which I wrote for the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, banging square pegs into round holes. And it was based on the fact that the West kept coming back to formula that didn't work. And the only way to make this work would be a greater Jordanian role. But if you do that, if I was a Jordanian and I heard an Israeli saying that, I would immediately jump and go, oh, he wants Jordan as Palestine. He wants to eliminate the Jordanian state. You have to, if you move down any kind of proposal for Jordanian-Palestinian relationship, you have to demonstrate how you're going to protect the Hashemite kingdom, Hashemite throne, Hashemite institutions. You're going to have to demonstrate how you're going to deal with the political complexity that emerges with East Bank, East Bankers, who don't want to become dominated by West Bank Palestinians. So it's, it's also not just a um, slogan you can put out. But clearly, if there was that kind of re-engagement, it might make solving this whole conflict much easier. Well, as much as we always like to, we don't like to, as much as we note the problems of uh, Jordan internally, uh, the King of Jordan has proven his ability up until now to maneuver in very difficult waters and to survive. And people have been writing off the future of uh, the Jordanian kingdom for many years, and there it is. It survives. But you have to create um, a way of strengthening the Jordanian state. I can tell you this, that there are thoughtful Palestinians very close to Abu Mazen who have said also that any solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict must also be based on Jordanian involvement. So it's not just a kind of a Israeli wish or a Jordanian wish, it's also a Palestinian wish. Now, how you make all that work, that's what diplomats are for. Well, I'm not trying to replicate the actions of anybody. I'm not, I, there's not somebody out there whose political philosophy I'm trying to specifically apply. My involvement in the, both the intellectual side, the diplomatic side of the Middle East, you know, comes from a number of individuals. One was my PhD advisor, Professor J.C. Hurwitz at Columbia University, who started his career as heading the Palestine desk in the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, which was the pre-CIA during World War II. And he was a very strong academic figure who demanded academic excellence and uh, made you work. So that certainly, he was certainly one of those figures that uh, affected me. I think um, how to maneuver between your own ideological principles and serving the state of Israel and advancing its diplomatic goals, I think Bibi Netanyahu has had a huge impact on me. And we have been together, I would say, since uh, the late 80s, early 90s, when he brought me in 1991 to the Madrid Peace Conference. Um, other individuals? First of all, I think he's brought about, just in the last number of years, a flowering of Israel's foreign policy. Um, when I was Director General, it was a common mantra you would hear. I remember going to the Herzliya Conference and hearing this repeatedly by all the pundits, that Israel's more isolated than ever. And then I found myself crisscrossing Africa and finding countries that just wanted to establish, re-establish diplomatic relations with Israel, that wanted to set up cooperation arrangements. And the reality that I became exposed to completely defied uh, 
the conventional wisdom that the op-ed writers were parroting uh, at that time. So he was helping create that new reality. I remember I went with him to, um, to uh, Uganda where we were commemorating the um, 40th year of the, of the Entebbe raid. And uh, right after the commemoration event, seven African countries, most of them represented by their heads of state, came to Uganda to meet with Bibi, meet with the Prime Minister of Israel. And what happens at meetings like that, there's a lot of horse trading that's done. And we had African leaders reaching out to other African leaders. Then I found myself sent to those countries. So I think part of his legacy is this blossoming of Israel's foreign policy. It comes at a time when we're trying to shrink our um, state spending. And you have to open new embassies in places that are very costly. But um, I think somehow we'll manage. Ambassador, thank you very much.